Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Andres Velendovsky. I'm head of School of Mathematics and Physics, which hosts uh, Lincoln Mass and Physics Week uh, 2021. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to see you here in our afternoon uh, mathematics uh, lecture. Uh, before the lecture start, uh, I will just say a few words about uh, hosting school and university, which organizes these events. Uh, if you did come to previous uh, lectures, you would hear already this introduction. But if you came for the first time, this is introduction for you. Uh, after that uh, will be our mathematics uh, uh, lecture and at any moment of time uh, you can type in your questions in a uh, live chat uh, to, to this YouTube uh, uh, stream uh, where uh, some of us exchanged hello to each other uh, or if you would like to have a completely anonymous question you can also type in it in a, a Padlet link which you received in your uh, email um, uh, uh, in, in invitation. Uh, I also will place this link in a live chat of YouTube. So if you cannot find your email, you just click on the link in YouTube uh, if you would like to use live chat. Now I just say a few words about our school and university. Hello everyone. I'm Professor Andres Velendowski, head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln, which hosts uh, Lincoln Mass and Physics Week 2021. Uh, this week uh, forms a part of uh, uh, British Science Week, which runs also the same dates. Uh, this year we have uh, our um, events, uh, lectures, all online. Uh, traditionally, in previous years, uh, you would come to our public lectures to our lovely campus uh, uh, by the uh, Brayford Pool, by Waterfront, this is how campus looks um, in the evening. Uh, but today we, uh, we do it online, uh, and in my introduction I just would like to give you a few words about uh, uh, our uh, uh, university and the school which organizes these uh, uh, lectures. Lincoln is a, a small city for approximately uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, our university is uh, uh, right next to the center, just about 10 minutes uh, walk. The city itself is quite old. It was already found by Romans uh, soon after they came to the British Isles. Uh, once it was also a base of famous Legion 9 Hispania before legionists moved to uh, uh, to York. Uh, the city received quite earlier uh, in 86 uh, prestigious status of a colonia, uh, so it became Lindum Colonia and Lincoln name came later on and that already happened in times of Emperor Domitian. Uh, the place uh, <clears throat> had a forum and a bath and uh, all uh, facilities uh, of Roman times and was a, a place for uh, retired uh, uh, legionaries. Uh, even today you still can find uh, remains, Roman remains, and you can walk or drive under this uh, uh, Roman arch of uh, Roman gates. The only one in Britain, through which uh, traffic is still allowed. Next big step in Lincoln development uh, was in times of another visitors. The William the Conqueror, William the uh, First, uh, came to British Isles. Uh, very soon, he ordered to build a, a famous uh, Lincoln Castle on the top of Lincoln Hill, and uh, uh, some years later. Uh, also, even more famous Lincoln Cathedral uh, started to be built uh, just opposite to Lincoln Castle. Uh, this cathedral is considered to be uh, one of the uh, most beautiful buildings, if not the most beautiful cathedral uh, in Britain and probably uh, around the world. Uh, 
for some period of time that was in fact the tallest building on the planet when a wooden spire was uh, uh, on the top of a main tower. A cathedral uh, is of course uh, was a seat of uh, learning already from Middle Ages. However, university appeared in Lincoln uh, much later in the end of the uh, 20th century. A campus uh, by the waterfront was opened uh, by Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, uh, much later, already in 21st century, uh, College of Science uh, was open, which included School of Mathematics and Physics, uh, which opened its doors in uh, 2014. And three years later, we also opened our own building, which uh, we share with schools of engineering and School of Computer Science. And just uh, a in about months, uh, we will be celebrating four years of this beautiful Isaac Newton building, named after Isaac Newton, a gentleman who also uh, comes from Lincolnshire. And uh, our lectures are primarily aimed at those who study mathematics or physics at A levels, because they're accessible to everyone who is curious <clears throat> about maths and physics. Uh, but maybe those who study a math and physical level will think about continuing the education after the school. And therefore, I'll mention what our school has here on offer uh, regarding degrees in math and physics. As you see, we have full range of degrees, uh, bachelor, three years degree, and integrated master's both in mathematics and in physics. Uh, we have also various combinations, uh, for instance, combination of uh, <clears throat> another Asian subject, uh, one of the most Asian subjects, philosophy. So we have a uh, degree in mathematics with philosophy and physics with philosophy, where philosophy is a minor component and physics or math are major components. And we have also a combination of mathematics and computer science and mixture of mathematics and physics as well. And with that, I welcome you to our uh, uh, next event in Lincoln Mars and Physics Week 2021. And I hope you will enjoy it. Welcome. Uh, hello and welcome to our main part, which will be a, a lecture by our afternoon speaker, uh, Dr. Simon Smith. I'm very happy Simon with us. Hello, Simon. Hello, Andre. Good to see you. Uh, so before lecture starts, I'll just uh, briefly introduce uh, Simon. Uh, Simon is a, a pure mathematician. Uh, who uh, received his undergraduate degree from Imperial College London and um, uh, a doctorate degree, higher uh, research degree uh, from University of Oxford. Uh, after doctorate, he decided to try something different and spent uh, uh, about four years uh, in a large uh, uh, European bank working uh, on things uh, uh, as, for instance, derivatives something quite different from uh, pure mathematics. Uh, however, later uh, he uh, uh, decided to, to, to go back to his uh, kind of uh, uh, scientific love, uh, pure mathematics. He had a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in uh, Syracuse University in the United States. Uh, and then he became assistant professor at City University of New York. Uh, during that time, uh, he also collaborated um, extensively uh, with, uh, uh, with Australia. Uh, and uh, uh, his, his next part was uh, uh, moving to uh, University of Lincoln in our School of uh, uh, Mathematics and Physics and joining 
our new center for algebra, which is called uh, Charlotte Scott Center for Algebra. Uh, we're very happy to have Simon with us uh, this afternoon, and floor to you, Simon. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to talk today about a concept that people often think of as being somewhat mystical and difficult to understand and uh, yeah, perhaps fundamentally unknowable. And what I'm going to try and show is that by thinking mathematically, um, so exploring the concrete, abstracting from that, and then, and then using that to understand uh, much more complicated situations, um, that by thinking mathematically, we can come to understand uh, the nature of infinity, or at least the nature of the infinite. Um, I'm going to ground this in uh, the study of, of um, sets and their sizes. So what do I mean by set? Well, a set is a mathematical construction, but we can roughly think of it as as a, a collection of objects. So think of it as, as being like a bag that you're putting things in, right? So here we can see um, that I've got a set, I've called it A, capital A, and it's the set containing the numbers one, two, and three. Um, here is another set. This is a set containing um, the numbers minus seven, 0 0.4, 19, 175, right? And I'm using these curly brackets to denote um, the set there, right? So everything inside is uh, is in the set. Um, we don't just have to put numbers in sets. We can put lots of things in sets. So um, here's a set with some numbers in and a cow and, um, and you know, a face. And here's another set, uh, D, that's got um, lots and lots of things in, right? Um, so this is how we're going to think of, of sets in, in this talk. We could be more precise, but uh, this is good enough for what we're talking about. Um, all those sets that I just talked to you about are finite. And um, so this is, there's, there's, some, uh, there's lots of infinite sets, and here's one. It's commonly denoted by capital N uh, for the natural numbers. That means. So these are the counting numbers, not including zero. So, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So this set is infinite. These three dots mean that it's going on forever. That's our notation to mean it's uh, carrying on forever. Um, here's another uh, well-known set. So it's usually denoted by, by a bold Z. Um, and that is the integers. Right? So that is infinite, but it's infinite in both directions, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, going on forever that way, but it's also got minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, and so on going on forever. So this is another infinite set. And you can see that it contains the natural numbers, right? Remember the natural numbers, the set bold N uh, is one, two, three, four, and so on. So, so the set of integers Z contains the set of natural numbers, which we're calling N. Let's uh, now think about uh, a slightly bigger set of numbers, which is the set of all fractions. Right? So that is all numbers that can be written as A divided by B, where A and B are integers and B is not zero. Um, so this is commonly denoted by a bold Q and, um, and is, is called the set of rational numbers. So I'll sometimes call it the set of rational numbers, I'll sometimes call it Q, I'll sometimes call it the set of fractions. And finally, the last infinite set of numbers that I want to introduce is uh, commonly denoted by a bold R, and it's called the set of real numbers. So this is the set of all decimal numbers, right? So if you think of how you write decimal numbers, right? So here's an example, 2.3333333, where the threes go on forever, right? The, the decimal expressions are infinitely long. Now, you might be thinking, well, hold on a minute. What about the number 2.7 that has 
only uh, finitely many decimal places, but actually, no, 2.7 is 2.7, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the zeros go on forever. So every real number uh, you can think of as a, as a, uh, um, as a number with an de infinite decimal expression. Or to put it another way, you can think of it as an integer, then a decimal point, and then an infinite string of, of decimal places, right? Where the decimal places range between zero and nine, and so on and so forth. So this is um, the last set of, of numbers that we're going to consider. These, these sets that I mentioned, n, natural numbers, q, fractions, Z, all integers, and R, the set of all decimal numbers, set of all real numbers, are going to form the basis of our exploration of, of the infinite. Now, um, let's talk about the sizes of these sets. So we're going to explore the sizes of these sets and use that as a way of exploring the infinite in a, in a uh, robust and and concrete setting. Um, we, uh, we, we, we have a term that we use to denote uh, or to um, talk about the size of a set and it's called its cardinality. Um, and the way that we denote the cardinality is with these two uh, horizontal lines that look a bit, if you're familiar um, with um, something called the absolute value, then they look uh, like the absolute value sign. So here's an example. Here's our set A that we saw right at the beginning. Um, and this is where I'm just going to pause for a second and, and just foreshadow our mathematical thinking. So you might be looking at that thinking, well, that set's obviously got three things in it, right? And, and you'll be right, right? It does have three things in it. So its cardinality is three. But the problem is if we just simply say it's obvious, it's three, and then we go through some more easy examples saying, oh, it's obvious, it's that. Um, what we're not doing is building up a formal way of talking about cardinalities that we can then use in more complicated situations. So let's think about what we really mean by there being three things in there. And so what I'm going to do will see like, seem like complete overkill, uh, for such a tiny set, but that is what we do when doing mathematics. We explore the things that are so obvious that we can understand them easily. Uh, we build up a framework, then we abstract it, and we use it to study much more complicated things. Uh, okay, so what do we mean by it's got size three? Well, here's one way to think of it. We can imagine that we've got three boxes, and can we put the things in the set A into those boxes. So every box contains one thing and there's only, and, and every box has something in it, right? So I'm numbering the boxes using the natural numbers. And um, uh, yeah, and we see if, if we can do that. And of course we can do that, right? We put number one from A in box one, number two in box two and, and number three in box three. So, the A has the same size as the same, it takes up the same space as this container of three boxes. Okay, um, what about B? Well, let's look at B. Uh, how many boxes do we need there? Well, we need four boxes, right? And D, well, how many boxes would we need? If we, if we counted those, we'd see uh, that we need 25 boxes. Um, and now we come to our first infinite set, so the natural numbers. Um, how much space does that take up? Well, it takes up an infinite amount of space, right? Um, so that doesn't seem very satisfying. Well, what if we use the size of the natural numbers as some kind of measure for the size of other infinite sets, right? That's a good idea. We were we were already putting things in boxes. Well, we can you can imagine that you've got an infinite set of boxes, box that where you've got box one, box two, box three, box four, box five, and so on and so forth. All those boxes are numbered according according to the natural numbers. Obviously, we can fit the natural numbers 
in that set of boxes. So maybe that's a good way of measuring infinite sets. And so let's try that. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe before I continue, maybe let me just point out that, that uh, we can make all this formal. I'm talking about boxes and the space taken up. The actual language that we use is a language to, to prove these things formally is the language of functions and, and what are called bijections. But it's equivalent to the setting that I'm talking about here, and it's a bit more accessible to talk about putting things in boxes. So let's think now about how much space a slightly larger set might take up. So let's denote uh, temporarily X, n with an asterisk um, as being the set of natural numbers with zero included. So, so we're putting uh, zero in. This, this symbol here means union. Um, so now we've got this n asterisk, and it's the set zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, going on forever. Now, how big is that set? Well, in other words, we've decided we're going to use the natural numbers, the space taken up by the natural numbers, as our our, our yardstick to measure how um, large all infinite sets are. So let's have a look, right? Here's the container that perfectly fits the natural numbers. I could put number one in box one, number two in box two, number three in box three, and so on. Every box contains one thing. Every, uh, well, contains precisely one thing, right? No box is empty. Every box contains precisely one thing, and all of the natural numbers are contained in a box. It's the perfect, perfect fit for the natural numbers. Ah, there's no space for zero. So it looks like n star is, an asterisk is bigger than, than n, right? It needs more space. But actually, we can, we can um, do some kind of trick. Even though n completely fills up all of these boxes, what we can do is to fit this, this, this number zero that we've got there hanging around outside, uh, we can move everything up on box, right? So we, we, we put number one in box two and number two in box three and number three in box four and number four in box five. Because there's no last box, that still works, right? Every natural number will still lie in a box. If you pick your favorite natural number, k, say, which box does it lie in? Well, it lies in box k plus 1. So every natural number still lies in a box. Um, and now all but one of the boxes contain precisely one thing. But we've got this, this space here, this empty box. And we can put, we can put 0 in it. So when we do that, now every number in n asterisk lies in a, in a box, and every box contains precisely one thing. So an asterisk is taking up exactly the same amount of space as the natural numbers. It completely fills all those boxes. So what does that mean? Because they take up the same exactly the same amount of space, they, they formally have the same cardinality. Hmm, well, that's interesting. Well, okay, what about something much bigger then? Let's look at, at Z, right? If we think about Z, so there's the natural numbers, there's Z. It looks like it's sort of twice as big, doesn't it? It's got all of the positive natural numbers and all of the negative uh, natural numbers, and it's got zero in there as well. So, yeah, so you might think, hmm, I think this is going to take up twice as much room. Um, well, let's see. So here's our container that is the, our yardstick for the natural numbers, the perfect way of measuring them. There they all are, hanging out in there. But actually, we can do a, a trick where we move everything in box n into box 2n. So... What would that entail? So that means that number one is moved into box two times one, box two. Number two is moved into box two times two. So that's box four. And number three is moved into box six and so on and so forth. So we do that. And when we do that, we now have created 
infinitely many empty slots, empty boxes, which is what we need, right? Like our last trick would only only created one uh, new empty spot, whereas we clearly need infinitely many to, to fit all of these in. So having done that, we can now put all of the um, these extra numbers underneath and just slot them in nicely, right? And again, we see every box contains um, precisely one number and every element of Z, every element of the integers is contained in a box. So this, this yardstick also perfectly measures the size of Z. So again, the cardinality of the natural numbers is equal to the cardinality of the integers. Right, now let's do something properly difficult. Let's look at, at Q, the set of all fractions. So the reason this is much more difficult setting is that the rational numbers are dense. I don't know if you've ever thought of this before, but what I mean by dense is that between any two rational numbers, between any two fractions, there's infinitely many more fractions. Well, we certainly don't have that with the integers, right? Between any two integers, there's only finitely many integers. Right? Between 10 and 20, well, we can list exactly which integers lie between 10 and 20. But you could never do that with a fraction. Right? The, 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 if you try to list the fractions between, uh, well, sorry, um, we, can, we can't easily do that with fractions. If you try to list the fractions between uh, a third and a half, you'll see that there's infinitely many that you have to list. So really, is that true? Let, let's have a look, right? So here's a number line. Um, let's, let's zoom in on it. So there's zero and one now. And let's just pick two fractions. A over B and C over D. So A and B and C and D are integers. B and D are non-zero. So there's our two fractions hanging out on our number line. And between them, we can find another fraction. There we go. Right, so how did I come up with that fraction? Well, you just remember your primary school way of adding uh, fractions together. So um, we... Uh, yeah, work out the difference between these two fractions, divide it by two, and then add it to the first fraction. So I've shown you that between two fractions, there's another fraction. But of course, now we've got A over B, and we've got this fraction in red. And we could just do the same thing again to show that there's another fraction between those two. And then we can keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And you, you can see that we can. there's no end to that. And we'll end up with infinitely many fractions. Right, okay, so because of that, like picture what we've been doing. We've always been listing the numbers in some sort of order, but how can we do that with fractions, right? I can't, if I try and say, say I go zero, and then I'll try and list the smallest fraction. Uh, what, one over a million? No, because between zero and one over a million, there's infinitely many more fractions. Okay, one over a billion. No, because zero, between zero and one over a billion, there's infinitely many more fractions. So you see, it, we can't do all of our previous tricks. So the fractions are dense. The natural numbers aren't. So maybe uh, the, the fractions have a higher cardinality. But it, it turns out, actually, they don't. We just need to be a little bit clever. So we're going to prove that they have the same size. Here's the size taken up by the natural numbers. and Let's try and write down all of the positive fractions because once we've, if we can show that the positive fractions fit into the same container, then we can just use the same trick we used between n and z to create enough space to fit all the negative fractions in. So let's try and list all the positive fractions, right? I'm going to do it in a table. So along the top, I'm going to keep track of the numerators, the numbers on the top of a fraction. And down the side, I'm going to keep track of the denominators, numbers on the bottom of the fraction. So let's do it, right? So that's one over one, right? The number on the top denotes the top number. So two and one, and then this will be th three and one and so on. And then this will be one over two, two over two, three over three, and so on. Uh, three over two, sorry, and, and so on. And we keep doing that, right? So now we've got this, this, this table. Now you'll notice there's lots of repeats, right? One over one is equal to one. Two over two is equal to one. Three over three is equal to one and so on. So we've got lots of repeats. Let's get rid of them all. And now let's try and list them. 
If we just look down a column and try and list them that way, this column is infinitely long. So if we do that, we'll never reach the end. And so we'll never, for example, get to two over three. So that's no good. That fails. We have the same problem if we list them according to the rows. So that fails. But actually, look, the diagonals are always finite in length. So if we follow this snaking red line, so we first of all pass through one over one. So we write that in our box down here. Then we come back on ourselves and we pass through two over one and one over two. So let's fill those in. And then we come back on ourselves again and we get to one over three and three over one. So we write those in and we keep going. And because the diagonals are always finite in length, we always get to turn around and hit the next diagonal. And you can see from this diagram that we, we always reach, uh, that we reach every single fraction. So this list now that we've, in, that we've put in our boxes, this, we, every single positive fraction lies in a box. It's a little bit complicated to work out which fraction lies in which box, but we're certain that we've done it. And every box contains precisely one fraction. So the positive fractions take up exactly the same space as the natural numbers. Um, okay, well, now we can just do the same trick that we did last time, right? So I've put natural numbers up here so we can see the trick. How do we fit Z into this container? Well, um, we moved everything in box N into box 2N. So let's do the same for our positive fractions. All right, we've done that. Now we've got infinitely many empty boxes, so we can write the negative versions underneath just like we wrote the negative versions of the, of the integers uh, before, and then we just slot them into the boxes. And so here we have the rational numbers, the fractions. Every fraction lies in a box. Every box contains um, uh, precisely one fraction. And so we see that the set of fractions takes up exactly the same space as the natural numbers. So they have the same cardinality. Wow. So what we've done is we've, we've really uh, gone to town here and we've looked at lots of infinite things. We've seen they're all the same size. Now let's look at the real numbers, the set of all decimal numbers. And I don't know, like maybe it's reasonable to think they probably have the same size. But actually, no, they don't. The real numbers, uh, the, the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly bigger than the cardinality of the natural numbers. And that means that some infinite numbers are bigger than others. That's an important thing. In fact, well, we'll, we'll see uh, um, in a little bit. I'll, I'll mention that some, that in fact, there's infinitely many infinite numbers. Now, let's see why the real set of real numbers is bigger than, with the cardinality of the real numbers is bigger than the cardinality of the natural numbers. Let's imagine they have the same size. Then we could do what we've done over and over again. We could fit them in all the boxes. Now, how can we list them? We, we don't necessarily know, right? We don't want to make any assumptions about how they're listed. Let's just assume they can be listed, right? So let's call the thing, the real number in the first box, A1, the real number in the second box, A2, a3, and so forth. What we're going to show is that no matter what anyone picks for those ANs, we can always find a real number that they missed out. So think about that. That means that if you assume that every real number lies in a box here and every box contains precisely one real number, we will show that there's always a real number missing. And then you think, well, I'll just reorder it as we've done before and slot it in. Then you've come up with a new way of fitting the real numbers in a box. But, you know, this is a generic ordering here. We, we haven't made any assumptions at all. So this new ordering that you've come up with will suffer from exactly the same problem. There'll be something that's missing. Now, let's see why it's missing. Something's going to go wrong. Imagine we've got all the real numbers there. I'm going to tell you that I can always write down a real number that's not in a box. And I'm going to call that number capital B. And it's got this decimal expression, 0 0.B1, B2, B3, B4, where these Bi's are the ith decimal place. So the numbers between zero, digits between zero and nine. And what's going to happen is that the, the nth decimal place of B, which is Bn, is going to differ 
uh, is not going to equal the nth decimal place of the of the nth number a n. Now let me try and explain uh, how I do that. But but one thing to note is that this will mean that b won't lie in any box because it it differs, right? Capital B can't equal a n because it differs from a n in the nth decimal place. Now we need to be a little bit careful because of 0.9 recurring, uh, equaling one, and these kind of technicalities, but we can get around those. So here's how I'm gonna build this B, here's the rule. How do I pick the first decimal place of capital B? Well, I look at the first decimal place of A1, right, that, that number in the first box. If it's a one, then I make B1 equal two. And if it's not equal to one, and I make it equal to two, right? So I look, let me say that again. I look at the first decimal place of A1. If I find it to be one, then I make the first decimal place of B two. So they're not equal. On the other hand, if I look at the first decimal place of A1 and I see it's not equal to one, then I'll make the first decimal place of B equal to one. So what that means then is that B definitely can't equal a one because they differ in the first decimal place. Now, what am I gonna do for B2, the second decimal place of B? I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna look at the second decimal place of A2. So remember A2 is the number in the second box. So I look at the number in the second box. I say, is the, your second decimal place one? If it is, I'm gonna make the second decimal place of B equal to two. On the other hand, if it's not equal to one, I'll make the second decimal place of B equal to one. So that means that B can't equal the number in the second box because it differs in the second decimal place. And the same with B3, but I'm gonna look at the third decimal place of the number in the third box. So again, B doesn't equal the number in the third box because box they differ in the third decimal place. And I don't have to worry about 0.9 recurring and things like that because I've deliberately picked these digits so that you don't end up with some kind of issues there. Uh, and I just carry on, I do that. And that's my rule for finding any decimal place of my number B. And what I see then is that my number B can't equal the number in the nth box because it differs in the nth decimal place. So what I've done is I've written down a number B that doesn't lie in any box. And because I wasn't strict about what the ordering was, right? I just said, write down any, you know, put your real numbers in the boxes however you want. Uh, this, this rule, this mechanism will always generate a number that is missing, uh, that isn't in any box. So this is a very fa famous argument called Cantor's diagonal argument. It's, it's a very beautiful argument. So let's just recap then. Why is the cardinality of the real numbers bigger than the cardinality of the natural numbers? Well, we imagine that they were equal. If they were equal, that would mean that R could take up the same amount of space as the natural numbers, as N, which would mean we'd be able to do this trick where we put every real number in a box and every box contains a real, precisely one real number and no real number is missing. But then we saw that we could always find a number that had been missed out, a number that wasn't in any box, that capital B. And what that means then is that the real numbers take up strictly more space than the natural numbers. So the cardinality is bigger. So what does this mean then, right? So we've, we've, you can go much further than this, right? You can you can play that same trick where you, you label the boxes by the real numbers and you can do the same thing and you can find sets that are even have even higher cardinality than the real numbers. So we've seen together that there's more than one infinite number, right? Where we're taking number here to be a cardinal number, right? The size of a set. Um, so there's more than one infinite number. Some infinite numbers are bigger than others. In fact, there's infinitely many infinite, uh, infinite numbers because as I said, you can just 
uh, repeat this argument, but with R, and then you get an even bigger set, and then you then do it again with that even bigger set, and you keep going and going. The smallest infinite number is actually the size, the cardinality of the natural numbers. So we give that a special name. We call that Aleph Null. So Aleph, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and Null being the zero that's a subscript. Um, any set that's got the same cardinality as the natural numbers is called countable. So countable sets are much easier to work with. And um, so, you know, how does this tie into uh, current re research and how is this um, uh, used, if you like? Well, uh, that, that's slightly harder to talk about. But, but, but my research, for example, is concerned with, with the... Um, with the ends of fractal-like diagrams. So probably you've heard of fractals, um, these sorts of um, shapes that when you zoom in, they look exactly the same, and they have lots of, of applications in finance and measuring. Um, so, yeah, my uh, research is kind of, if you, if you look at this tree-like diagram here and you imagine the, the very if you could continue this path until uh, um, each of these branch paths uh, to infinity, if you like, uh, you can imagine the, the that forms a set that's called the set of ends. And it's very complicated to study because it doesn't, um, it's, it's what's called totally disconnected. It's, it's a very peculiar set. But it turns out that although that those ends have the same cardinality as the, as the real numbers. Their symmetries can be understood by looking at symmetries of countable substructures. So kind of uh, basically looking at the symmetries of this, of this shape. And so this interplay between things that are sets that are countable and sets that are uncountable um, are, are, are really useful um, when you're trying to prove things about sets and geometries that are very difficult to conceptualize. Well, I hope you um, enjoyed the talk and, and learned something. Um, thank you. Yeah, I got a lot of questions there. That's good. I don't know that I can get through them all in 15 minutes, but I'll try. So, yeah, now we will answer uh, the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, 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 people get excited and uh, some questions already arrived in, uh, in Padlet. Uh, uh, and uh, again, I just mentioned uh, people can type in questions directly in a live chat or in a Padlet and I'll read them uh, uh, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, so there is, there are two related questions, as I think. One is, uh, what made you decide to choose this field? And then related, I would say, question, did abstract math help in your work in bank? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, these are good questions. Um, so I suppose when I was uh, 17 or 18, I was really into physics, I really liked physics, and then I read this this poster about why one should choose to do mathematics at university. And uh, I found it kind of compelling. Um, it's sort of, in some sense, like this study of logical argument. And so I, I changed my UCAS form and applied to do mathematics. And then it just pure mathematics in particular, university just blew me away, right? And, and in particular, uh, the study of group theory. It's, it's the, the, the study of all, um, you can think of it as a study of symmetry, right? And I don't mean symmetry in some kind of uh, um, sense that you see at primary school, but I mean, and lots and lots of systems have symmetry to them that you might not necessarily think of. And and um, yeah, it's just very beautiful. And and so then I was also really interested in set theory and um, and the nature of the infinite. And then, so all my research is in infinite uh, infinite group theory. So those two things kind of merged. And um, 
Yeah, like my actual specific expertise, though, came about because when I was choosing my final year project, uh, which which we have uh, here in Lincoln, I, I I was looking through the library and I just kind of picked this random book up and uh, um, yeah, and it was on infinite permutation groups and it, it blew my mind. It was uh, so beautiful and uh, yeah, so then I just couldn't uh, couldn't escape. It was too attractive. Um, in terms of working at a bank, I think um, pure mathematics. Hell, okay, I have to be careful because there's some physicists uh, here as well. But like pure mathematics helps you do anything. It it uh, you are taught to think differently to everyone else, right? You 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 have to be on the one hand very very creative, um, and but then on the other hand like incredibly precise. And so the, typically what you what we train pure mathematicians to do is to think mathematically. So you see something. You abstract it, so you create the most abstract kind of model for it that you can, and then you apply it to as many places as as, as you like, or well, other people do, uh, because you're a pure mathematician. You're you're on the next level of abstraction, and you're doing something else. So, on that count, it it, it was very useful working in a bank because it meant all I had to do. I'd I'd never done any economics or studied any financial mathematics, and I the the bank you know, hired me uh, as a as a research quant, so doing research into, pure ma into financial mathematics. And yeah, they just said, read some books. You know, a couple of months later, I, I, I started. So, and we had, you know, I was in charge of hiring at some points in the bank and we had a, a real, there's a real shortage of pure mathematicians with certainly with doctorates. So all of the investment banks kind of fight over them. Um, and yeah, so it, yeah, it really, it gives you the ability to step into any kind of area you want with confidence, learn the language, you know, learn the, what the words mean and be very, very confident that you'll be able to, to, um, to uh, intellectually dominate it. Uh, it's not an easy subject, but it's, but it's a very powerful one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are some uh, quite mathematical questions, as uh, we hoped, of course. Uh, yeah. Are there infinities bigger than real numbers? Uh, okay. So I suppose it depends what you mean by this question. So, do you, I assume you mean the set of real numbers, right? Because every real number is finite, so any infinity is bigger than than any real number. But if you mean the set of real numbers, absolutely. So. You need a slightly more sophisticated language to to describe it than I used in the talk because the talk was by analogy. But you can imagine uh, lots and lots of boxes where each box corresponds precisely to one and only one real number. So in effect, you name all of your boxes where I named them box one, box two, box three, and so forth. You instead name them box pi, box you know blah 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 for every single real number, and then you can apply the same. Um, uh, sort of like the same argument in spirit, uh, let's say. Um, it, it requires modification, but you can do it, and you then end up with something that's even bigger. So if you have studied any kind of high-level mathematics, you might be familiar with power sets. And so it's the set of all subsets. And what you can show is that the power set of the natural numbers has the same cardinality as the real numbers. And the power set of the real numbers has cardinality strictly bigger than the real numbers. But then you, you know, the power set of the power set, and you can keep going, you can get this, this uh, never ending tower of infinite cardinal numbers. There's a whole other type of infinite number called an ordinal number. They're the same when they're finite, but you, you end up with a completely different uh, type of mathematics when studying ordinal numbers. And yeah. you can ask for cardinalities of ordinals and it's all very beautiful. and. Okay. Yeah, rich. So is it, uh, then there is, I see another question, and probably uh, I, I can guess answer, but maybe it's for you actually question. <laughs> is <laughs> there the largest infinity? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, uh, <laughs> so my guess was okay. <laughs> and then, okay, there are a couple of more. Is this type of infinity taught in Lincoln? Uh, yes, yeah. In fact, that lecture that I gave is basically like a, uh, an, a more accessible version of what is covered in one of the first year courses, right? It's the proof is done by bijections, which is a, um, a type of function. So it's the proof is a bit more abstract and allows you to see more clearly how it can be kind of ramped up to larger sets. But um, yeah, this is a this is a first year topic. 
There is also quite philosophical question, but maybe it's mathematical, I don't know, or maybe physics. Uh, how do all these infinities fit in the universe? Ah, uh, right. I suppose, so that is a difficult question to answer because what tends to happen as a pure mathematician is you become somewhat dislocated. You're, you're disassociated from the physical universe, right? Um, it's quite, you, you spend so long conceiving of infinite dimensional space and all these different things that that the idea that you should, that the way that our kind of monkey brains and monkey eyes perceive our universe to be um, should in any way, uh, yeah, be a limiting factor on what we can conceive. I, I suppose you quickly abandon that. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. But if you are, if you want to stay rooted in reality, then you end up with a kind of hyper finitist approach, and that also. So actually, you know. there is a question related, uh, uh, just as you mentioned, just a second. Uh, uh, do you think there is any weight in finitist arguments? Yeah, it depends. So this is again one of the ways in which being a pure mathematician is so wonderful is if you study a lot of logic, you, you also become very comfortable exploring any mathematical universe. So the way that pure mathematicians typically think is we take some assumptions that we that are called axioms, and then you explore the mathematical universe that they allow, right? And so in set theory, typically, you know, maybe you choose well, a set of axioms that are called ZFC that describe the basic properties of sets. And then you take those rules to be self-evident and you explore the universe. Now that um, there are different sets of axioms that you might choose. Sorry, when I say universe, I mean the mathematical universe that they define. You could pick a smaller subset of axioms and explore that instead. It might not be as rich, uh, or you could, you know, or it might be more rich. I mean, if you reduce this number, then it would, then it would probably end up being more rich. Um, so the the very finite, like finitist uh, approaches, just require a different set of axioms, and uh, it's equally valid mathematically. But what tends to happen is you end up with things that are that you you end up with a restricted mathematical universe that in some sense is a little bit boring to explore. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not valid. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see there are a couple of questions that you mentioned logic. Uh, so there are uh, one question a bit from history kind of of Mars and uh, kind of logic. Uh, uh, one was... Uh, when did people understand about different infinities? And then it continues, did Greeks know about this? And then I see it was another question, which was telling, can this help solve Zeno paradox? Um, right. So I suppose um, I'm not a, an expert on the history of mathematics. So this, this argument that I gave you is actually a very famous argument called Cantor's diagonal argument. And it comes from the... Uh, late 1800s, so around the late, so, okay, I'm not going to like completely brutalize the history of mathematics, but you have, uh, you know, this very formal, um, uh, um, you know, kind of Euclidean geometry, right? And then you have a lot of intuitionist mathematics develop. Um, when the calculus was developed, it was also done largely um, by intuition. And then as you, you end up with a, uh, then a series of paradoxes became apparent and there was a movement to formalize mathematics based on set theory. And then uh, the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s, you then start to see uh, a lot of, of not necessarily paradoxes, but kind of a pushback against that formalism with uh, to some extent, what, what looked at the time to be holes appearing. So one of them is Cantor's diagonal argument proving that there's different sizes of infinity. Um, another is Gödel's incompleteness theorem and things like that. But the beauty of pure mathematics is that th these theorems are absorbed and, and, and the theory builds on them. These aren't, these aren't earth-shattering things like they would be in, say, uh, yeah, in in a in a weak subject, they 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 are part of 
the nature of mathematics and, and they tell us things about the limits of what can be known and, and not known. I, I would, by the way, thoroughly recommend looking up Gödel's incompleteness theorem if you don't know about it. And, and something called the continuum hypothesis, which is related both to my talk and to Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It, um, it's also very exciting. Yeah, it, it is indeed uh, kind of a very exciting topics that, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, it, it kind of, yeah, shows beauty of, of all this uh, abstract mathematics when you you think about these things and just mind blowing. Um, just I'm looking on. Uh, there was a, there was a question uh, um, just kind of as a um, maybe it's not. Uh, uh, is it possible to solve an equation like infinity plus one? It probably means equal to some, maybe to another infinity. I mean, absolutely. So my first year project when I was an undergraduate was on the uh, on arithmetic of infinite cardinals, right? And so this is the kind of crazy pace of a mathematics degree. It's like you do a level where you largely learn to follow the algorithm steps, right? And then suddenly at the end of your first year, you're writing projects on, on the arithmetic of infinite numbers. And so absolutely you can. And, and, uh, and it depends on whether you're looking at a cardinal or an ordinal number. These are both infinite numbers. So, you know, an infinite ordinal plus one uh, will be different. Uh, whereas a cardinal plus one, if you think through that argument I gave where we took the natural numbers and inserted zero in and showed it had the same cardinality, would argue that it is a proof that aleph null plus one is equal to aleph null. So the first infinite ordinal is called omega, the first infinite cardinal is called aleph null. And yeah, uh, omega plus one is not equal to omega, but aleph null plus one is equal to aleph null. So uh, yeah, you, you, there's a this, lot more depth, um, but not enough time to talk about it. Really. Yeah, you have to come really, to Lincoln and talk to me if you, uh, yeah, if you're interested in this kind of thing. Yes, yes, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, with that, we see. I see uh, uh, that we arrive to exactly six o'clock, and I think it's a very good note that uh, if you have a. a more numbers on infinity, or if you have infinite number of questions uh, <laughs> on uh, on mathematics, uh, please just do come to Lincoln either to ask questions to us or to study mathematics with us. Uh, so I'm really um, uh, uh, happy uh, about these discussions. Uh, we did not manage uh, to answer all the questions in time we have. Uh, but I do thank uh, Simon for this wonderful afternoon and uh, having me and for all the lovely questions. Uh, illuminating discussions. And I thank all the, the, those who came and watched us and asked questions. Uh, thank you very much. And we hope to see some of you perhaps uh, uh, on our final evening tomorrow. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye bye.